So we're going to carry on, and I'm really excited about this one. This has some great slides, we'll say. I was going to say pictures, but it's some really interesting and compelling information that will continue to build the case on really why a UNLV med school is just the most brilliant idea ever created. So we're going to have um, Dr. John Hudak come and speak to us about um, outsourcing medical education from Nevada, the cost and the consequences. All right. Good morning, everyone. I normally give talks without notes, but the morning presentations were so good that I was jotting notes down about how they can fit into my own. So you'll excuse me if I'm sort of tethered to this desk at times. What I'm going to talk a little bit about is what's going on in Nevada in general, but particularly uh, down here in the South, and that is an outsourcing of medical education. Um, Nevada, in Nevada, in a lot of ways, really helps deliver funds and patients, private and public economic activity to medical schools, to hospitals, to community health centers, to medical students, to doctors. The problem is all of them are in another state. They're not here. And that's the basic crux of outsourcing. Uh, when you have a product or you have the capacity for a product and that product is either made and or consumed elsewhere. And in certain ways, we think of this in the manufacturing industries, we think of it in a whole host of areas, but for medical education, that's not something that we normally think about. That's not a way that we normally conceptualize it. But the, the problem is, is, is fairly severe here. It's explicit. You have a, a, the result of this outsourcing is a broad-based, widespread, life-threatening public policy problem for the state of Nevada that has to be addressed for the success, for the health, for the livelihood of the people in this state. And it's, it's a serious problem that leads to a loss in federal funding, a loss in the quality and the quantity of health care, and it's something that affects certain populations more than others. Uh, as some of our speakers said earlier, if you have the wealth to go anywhere in the world or anywhere in the country that you want to go to get fixed medically what needs to be fixed, you're going to go to LA, you're going to go to New York, you're going to go to uh, Minnesota, you're going to go to Cleveland, you're not going to go to Las Vegas. And a way to build this city in terms of its healthcare capacity is to make people think not just about the Cleveland Clinic, not just about Johns Hopkins, not just about the UCLA Medical Center, but to think about the UNLV Medical Center and the UNLV Medical School as a way to do that. But the populations that are hurt are not the people who can hop on a plane and be in LA quickly. The populations that are hurt are women, are children, are people from underrepresented minority groups, people who are in poverty or next to poverty, people who don't have these health care options. They just have whatever Las Vegas can give them, and that's a serious problem. So what are some of the requirements of outsourcing? First, as I said, you need a product of value. Um, you need something palpable, something that people want or need, and you also need a geographic transfer. There has to be a location of origination for this product and then the destination of that product. And you also need a cost to the location of origination. In this case, it's people who want medical training. People who are interested in the medical sciences, people who want to go to med school, people who want to do residencies or fellowships, and I think I jumped ahead. So in the context of medical education, every state has health care needs. We know this. Every state, every population has health care needs. And every state also has medical training opportunities. Despite the fact that um, f only 44 states have medical schools, uh, allopathic medical schools in the US, Every state, in some sense, has the capacity to train people in different ways, whether it's in the classroom, in the 44 states plus the District of Columbia that have allopathic medical schools, or whether it's in residency programs or fellowships in hospitals or in other healthcare centers. Every state also has additional training capacity, even uh, what was mentioned earlier, the five big states in the Northeast that, that train um, a good majority of our, our uh, med students and also have a, a, a large number of, sorry, not a good majority, a good number of our med students and also have several, uh, a large percentage of uh, residency programs. They also have additional capacity and you know what? They're taking advantage of it. States that aren't are rapidly falling behind. And so you have a supply and demand of medical professionals um, in the same way that you would have supply and demand for any, any product or in any market. And so 
in some states there are surpluses of medical professionals, and so uh, when that happens, you're, you're training a lot of people, you're, you're getting them ready to practice, and then you're sending them out into the world, and a lot of them are, of course, coming here, because the uh, opportunities for medical training here are, are so few. And then in others, here, uh, you, uh, in, in really, this is true everywhere in the United States, you have shortages of med medical professionals. States need doctors. Every state needs more doctors. Some states need doctors more than others, and I'll talk a little bit later on about where Nevada falls in, in, those, uh, in that sense. And so the result is that states are importers or exporters, as we heard earlier, of medical training and of medical professionals. And where a state falls within that range really has a lot to do with as, as Rob mentioned earlier, whether it's at parity in terms of healthcare markets, whether it is uh, earning its potential in terms of revenue, in terms of jobs, in terms of uh, associated industries and assets that come with it. So the outline of the talk, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the geography uh, and the geographic needs for medical, uh, medical school in Nevada. This is, of course, uh, in southern Nevada, rather. This is, of course, now a foregone conclusion. We're, we're, you're going to have a medical school here. But I think understanding what kinds of opportunities are presented by a new medical school, understanding the geography of it, which many of you already know, is absolutely essential. There's also a healthcare basis and a healthcare need for a new medical school. And then the, the core of the talk, which, which touches the core of my research, which is the funding basis, particularly federal funding opportunities that come with the establishment of a new allopathic medical school. And then finally, I'll conclude. So here's a quick map of states with and without medical schools. Uh, uh, several states have one. As I said earlier, six states have none. Several states have five or more. Um, and, and some of those states you would expect, like California, Texas, New York. But other states, like Michigan, now has uh, uh, six medical schools, uh, in part because they've established three of them in the past uh, four years. Um, which uh, suggests something about the opportunities presented by medical schools, regardless of whether you're in uh, a medical training desert like Las Vegas is. Um, establishing them can be money makers, can create real opportunities, not just for the university, but for the communities around them. And as I said earlier, in terms of uh, funding opportunities, both private and public. Here's the distribution of medical schools um, in the United States. Um, uh, over 140 of them. Uh, the, one of the previous speakers had mentioned the, the cluster of fellowships and residency programs in the Northeast. We can see uh, from uh, Chicago to Boston and down to Washington, D.C. are uh, quite a few of the medical schools. But here are the top 50 metropolitan statistical areas, MSAs with and without medical schools, uh, allopathic medical schools. That, those are the ones I'll be talking about throughout the duration here and, and where they are. Most of them, as you see in red, have a medical school, at least one. Some of them have many. Um, then uh, there are a few, uh, Charlotte, Jacksonville, and Phoenix. Um, they have branch campuses of their state's medical schools. Uh, Jacksonville has one from the University of Florida. Uh, Charlotte has one from UNC. And, and of course, Phoenix has a branch campus from Arizona. There are only two without. One is San Jose, which we'll look at a map of shortly. And the other uh, is Las Vegas. So let's understand these two, uh, these two MSAs without medical schools and their relative impact, the relative deficit that's created. Um, uh, I'll get to that in a moment. Then CSA is another measure of uh, metropolitan size and capacity. If you look at the top 50 in the United States, uh, two, Charlotte and Jacksonville, have their branch campuses. Only one in the United States doesn't, and it's Las Vegas. <coughs> So here's the deficit San Jose faces. San Jose in blue down at the bottom, uh, that is the MSA, the Metropolitan Statistical Area, uh, without one. Now, when it's combined into the Greater Bay Area CSA, uh, San Jose does obviously have multiple medical schools. So there are two medical schools in San Francisco. There's one in Palo Alto, Stanford, and there's one in Sacramento. They're not far away. So San Jose, while in itself has a, a, a geographic deficit of a medical school, it's only 17 miles up the road to one of the best medical schools in the United States in Stanford. So that deficit needs to be framed in perspective. You know, I didn't go to Yale, but I grew up 20 miles away from it, and I can tell you when I had a cold and had a mother who was nervous about every healthcare need, eh, you go to Yale. And so uh, maybe I had a Yale deficit, but you know, you benefit from it. Here's Las Vegas. 
So I'm going to give you a second just to take this in. Las Vegas' nearest medical school is not Reno. Um, uh, it is Loma Linda, California. Um, there are a lot of medical schools between uh, uh, here and Las Vegas that are closer than between here and Reno. In, in fact, many of them on the map. Um, and and that, that shows you there's a real deficit. And it goes back to the effects underrepresented populations have. When medical schools create such advances in a community, in a small and large region, about what is happening, what kinds of capacities there are, not just for medical education, but for the medicine that serves those communities, you understand that this deficit is severe. And there are a lot of people who can get to LA and to Loma Linda and to Tucson and to Salt Lake City and to Reno easily, but there are a lot more people who can't. And a lot of those people who can't don't necessarily look like the people who have been standing up here speaking to you today. They're some of the hardest hit people in the United States economically and socially, and they've gone through hell in the past six years um, since a recession. And this, this desert, not, not climate desert, but medical education def desert, really contributes to this in a very serious way. And th this map I find jarring, absolutely jarring. So here are the top 100 largest MSAs without an allopathic medical school. Um, as you'll see, Santa, uh, uh, Las Vegas uh, is the largest, uh, of course, uh, next to, with the exception of Charlotte. Charlotte is larger than Las Vegas, but um, it has a branch campus. So does Greenville, so does Phoenix, uh, so does uh, Jacksonville, uh, so, so does Grand Rapids. And so, I'm sorry, Phoenix is larger. That number is uh, Tucson's population rank uh, uh, for, uh, uh, in an MSA, not Phoenix's. But all of these large MSAs without medical schools, without uh, uh, central campuses of medical schools, they do have branch campuses. The exception, of course, being San Jose, which is the closest of all of them uh, to the nearest one, San Jose being, uh, as I said, down the, ro down the road from Stanford, Bridgeport being just down the road from Yale. Uh, again, understanding where Las Vegas lies on this list relative to other large metropolitan statistical areas um, is, is really important. And the two that are further from them, Boise, uh, um, which is uh, uh, 340 miles uh, from Salt Lake City, and Spokane, which is 279 miles from Seattle, uh, that's really difficult for those towns. And, and they're facing challenges as well. But Las Vegas doesn't need to be one of those towns. Las Vegas doesn't need to be a Spokane. It doesn't need to be a Boise. It can be a, a healthcare center um, on its own that not just serves a medical population in need, but also serves medical students who want to be trained here and want to be trained in an MSA, which has real appeal. So how are metropolitan areas responding to this? They're responding to it by building medical schools. Um, what's, what's remarkable to me is between 1980 and 2000, or 1980 and 1999, one medical school, one MD granting institution was established in the United States. Um, since 2013 have. That's not by accident. Um, the reason is, and this goes up to 2013, these are ones that are currently admitting students. That doesn't include uh, Austin, which is opening a medical school in 2016. Of course, it doesn't include the medical school opening here um, uh, uh, excitingly sooner, sooner than I think a lot of people um, expected, and other cities that are opening either uh, new medical schools or additional ones as well. These universities are doing this for a reason, and, and I've mentioned some of these reasons already. They do not typically come with financial losses for a university, for a state, for a community, for a market, for a population. They come with real benefits. Now that's true regardless of where they are located, and it's true um, uh, in terms of where they're located uh, geographically, but also in terms of a market sense. Of the new medical schools founded since the year 2000, you can see um, the distance from them. The, the largest distance being the um, uh, Texas Tech uh, Foster School established in El Paso, which was uh, nearest either New Mexico or Texas Tech Lubbock. Um, those being quite far away. Next, of course, being Florida State, which was uh, quite a distance from the University of Florida. But some of these, the, the um, uh, Cleveland Clinic's Learner College was established on the same campus of an existing medical school. 
a, a Quinnipiac from my home state of Connecticut was established nine miles down the road from one of the finest medical schools in the world at Yale. So regardless of proximity, uh, medical schools are popping up and they're doing well and they're bringing in private money, they're bringing in market money, they're bringing in federal funding, they're bringing in state funding. And, uh, but despite the fact that some of these are opening on the same campus or down the road from, from in some cases exceptional universities, uh, exceptional medical schools, uh, there are obviously geographic needs being met here. The Commonwealth College in Pennsylvania, Virginia Tech's um, Carrollton School in, in Roanoke, and uh, Florida State obviously popping up because there are market needs and geographic needs for, for the expansion of medical education. But it's more than just about geography. There's a real healthcare need in, uh, uh, in states for medical training, and, and uh, th this is exceptional. So uh, there are so shortages of medical professionals, as the note uh, mentions, measured by medical professionals per 100,000 residents in a state. And Nevada is doing well. It's not, uh, it's not doing too bad for plastic surgeons, which does, is not on the list. It does all right um, in that sense. But in terms of uh, states, including the District of Columbia, thus the, the 51, Nevada is doing terribly in a nation that is plagued by healthcare shortages, by physician shortages, and in a nation where millions and millions of people are newly insured and have access to healthcare for sometimes the first time in their lives, in a nation facing all of those challenges, Nevada is facing bigger challenges. Nevada is among the worst in the nation in terms of the number of doctors to serve the community and the communities throughout the state, not just here in the South, but throughout the state. And that's a real challenge, and it shows a real healthcare need for not just establishing a medical school in Las Vegas, but establishing it in the right way. Public policy can be created um, uh, sometimes out of thin air, sometimes for good reasons, but it can also be created poorly. So the challenge moving forward, that was one of the questions at the end of the uh, last panel, what are the challenges? I would say funding is obviously a challenge, but I would argue that the challenge now is not the if, because we're there, it's, it's getting it right. And these numbers have to change. defense that people often face, particularly now with the Affordable Care Act in place, um, the first line of defense that people have in, in having their health care uh, needs met, Nevada is 47th. Five primary care doctors per 100,000, I'm sorry, primary care students uh, per 100,000 people with a national average of 12.2. So, so those numbers too, I'm presenting you doomsday uh, staggering numbers uh, all day, so my apologies. We'll have a, we'll have a pep rally afterwards. Um, but we have, to, we have to pass around the Kleenex box for at least another 15 minutes. But there is a silver lining in the silver state, and that's loyalty. Uh, this was mentioned before, um, about medical training as it exists in Nevada, um, as meager as it is, um, it does exist, and 69.2% uh, of Nevada residents in MD programs come from the state. Um, so people who, and this is true in a lot of states, though Nevada is a little bit above the national average in this sense, um, Nevadans who want to become doctors want to become doctors in Nevada, and they want to be trained here. So that shows this capacity, this expansive capacity within the state 
that if we open a new medical school, if we expand the number of graduates we have, uh, it's essentially the, the field of medical school dreams. If you build it, they will come. And they'll come from other states, for sure, but they'll also come from Nevada. And that's an opportunity that doesn't just serve the region, but it serves everyone in the state who really wants medical education and doesn't want to have to go to Loma Linda or Tucson or New Haven or Boston or Scranton to get it. Among people who attend medical school and perform their residency in Nevada, 79% um, of people stay in the state. That's the fifth nationally. See, there, I guess there, is, there are some positive aspects of this talk. There are only four states in the US that do better than, uh, uh, than Nevada in that sense. The national mean is, is uh, uh, two and three. So, so those are good numbers. Beyond the healthcare needs, there's a funding basis for it. And so uh, these tables were drawn from separate pages of a report by AAMC, which, am I correct, Paul, you had a hand um, in, some of, in, in some or all, I'll say all of this work, since it's not you saying it, I'll give you all the credit. Since 95. Uh, there we go, since 95. These are not from the dark days of 94 and earlier when Paul wasn't involved. <laughs> Because um, you, you, you just can't trust those numbers. But these you can trust. This is from fiscal year 2013. Um, it shows uh, revenues for medical schools, uh, uh, the median being $521 million um, for all revenues. For public school revenues, obviously that's lower, the median being $484. Um, I'm, I'm happy with this report in that they use the median because what happens with medical schools is that outliers can very much distort uh, the mean. And so schools like Yale and Harvard and Johns Hopkins, the Cleveland Clinic and others are going to skew these revenues plus uh, schools in markets that are just naturally more expensive like my home of Washington DC and LA. Those are going to skew those revenues. So the median is the better measure of central tendency and $484 million in average public school revenue for a medical school isn't bad. What else is important to talk about here, which is going to be a, a good uh, portion of the discussion of the remainder of my talk, is the section on federal grants and contracts. So federal grants and contracts show this federal opportunity that I'm talking about. They account for 16% of the uh, funding that goes to public medical schools in the United States. That's about $80 million. $80 million in federal grants and contracts, and I would say that um, as someone who studies, I, I don't study medical funding um, uh, typically, I study federal funding generally, that's a low ball, uh, that is probably a low ball categorization of the way that federal dollars writ large flow into a medical school. These are likely going, contracts it can come from a variety of sources, um, but federal grants as we think of them like NIH funds, funds HRSA funds, and uh, other funds like that, those are flowing into the, these medical schools and providing these numbers, but federal money is also fitting in.
companies that uh, only have one and are still doing quite well. So the addition of a second medical school in Nevada will help, but what it shows is that the existing medical school in Nevada clearly isn't doing something right. If states like Iowa and states like Colorado can be in this top 25 and Nevada can't. There are also several uh, states on this list that have two medical schools in them, which uh, with the establishment of the new uh, program at UNLV, uh, uh, will be in that category, Connecticut, Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Alabama. The last two I mentioned, Wisconsin and Alabama, have two public, non-prestigious uh, uh, medical schools in their state. Uh, Connecticut on this list, uh, at the time in 2009, only had two, Yale and UConn. They've established Quinnipiac since. Um, but Wisconsin and Alabama are, are peers in the sense of uh, where Nevada will be after the establishment of, of the second medical school. As I said, having two public uh, medical schools, uh, neither being prestigious. Minnesota has um, uh, the Mayo Clinic and uh, Connecticut obviously has Yale, which boosts them up uh, in the rankings. But it can have really serious economic impacts that are, that are going to be positive, not just for Las Vegas, but for the state. And that also extends to full-time employment as well. Um, this list, in terms of the states on it, generally overlap uh, with the last list. But uh, this is uh, publicly funded research, the economic impact in terms of employment um, of that research in these states. Uh, thousands and tens of thousands of jobs because a, a medical school and a new medical school can bring jobs and money and interest um, to a state and to a community. So I'm not going to go into much detail about GME funding, um, though I have a chart on it, because Paul did a, a, an absolutely magnificent job, born um, l uh, in large part on his absolute knowledge advantage on the topic relative to mine. But GME funding is an important part of funding uh, in, in healthcare, and, uh, and I'm talking about federal funding in this area. It comes from the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid. As Paul said, it, it, it um, uh, is calculated, the delivery of funds to states is calculated based on a very ornate, I think ornate is a nice word, formula, an equation that determines how much um, medical, uh, I'm sorry, how much hospitals uh, receive. But the point of GME funding is to help assist in residencies and in, to assist in graduate medical education residencies and fellowships. It's the large uh, largest funding source of uh, uh, GME funding in the U.S. Uh, tends to be from CMS, and right now there are efforts to reform it. Paul talked a little bit about these. They're hard to get traction. Of course, everything is hard to get traction in this Congress, but what's, you, what's interesting about the reform bills currently out there is that they're bipartisan, something you don't often see in Congress, and so that's a real benefit. If there's going to be a change, there's an opportunity here that reform could happen based in large part because very odd bedfellows are interested in this. You have one bill in particular is a Tea Party member from Illinois with a, a, uh, uh, an absolute progressive liberal uh, from the West Coast who really want to see these, thing, uh, these uh, changes in place. And those changes are important for a state like Nevada. They don't just want to shovel pork at important senators, though you can, you can certainly bet that's going to happen if these reform bills pass. But what they want to do is start to reform the archaic ways in which this, uh, these funds are calculated and delivered into a new 21st century American healthcare economy. And part of that is going to serve underserved states, states that traditionally have lacked in this area, Nevada obviously being one of them, um, but also communities that have tended to be underrepresented, Latinos, African Americans, the poor, areas where the population is growing faster than the markets that can serve them. These are all, uh, uh, these are all groups, these are all sort of red flag areas that will benefit Nevada more than they'll benefit these core states we talked about before, New York, Connecticut, Massachusetts. These are states that are probably going to lose a bit in some of these reform bills, whereas states in the Mountain West, states that are trying hard to serve these underserved publics, states that are building new medical schools and trying to expand graduate medical education opportunities within their states, they're the ones who are going to benefit. So establishing a medical school at UNLV now is hedging a bet, pun intended, 
um, that uh, you know something is going to happen in Congress, and and then taking the bet that something good is going to happen and it's going to be good for the state. Beyond GME, there are other types of federal funding opportunities, as I mentioned, in terms of grants, in terms of NIH funds, and other funds from the Department of Health and Human Services, um, but also from other odd departments, the Department of Defense, the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, there are a lot of uh, federal agencies that are engaged in the business of health care, more so now with the passage of the Affordable Care Act and the priorities set forth by this president and the next president, who as a presidency scholar I can tell you is almost surely to be a Democrat. The, uh, there are a lot of funding opportunities that exist. They're going to continue to exist. Um, in addition, there are federal dollars from tuition that I think is often overlooked. That's a very easy transfer from the uh, federal government to the states because a lot of people who go to medical school need federal uh, funding to get there. Federal loans, federal grants, and, and that's, that's freebie money for a state. And, and tuition dollars matter. On the pie charts I showed earlier, they are a small percentage, but they matter and they're stable flows of funds for a medical school that um, uh, the people who are working on uh, accounting in your medical schools can be pretty sure they can count on um, uh, it, it, uh, at a lot higher rate than even undergraduate education can. There are program pl plans and philanthropy that provide private sources of information. What this amounts to is that federal funding in general, nothing like leaving your clicker at the podium, um, uh, federal funding in general, there are a lot of opportunities, both public and private, um, to not just get a medical school off the ground, but to expand the healthcare market in general. So let's look at GME funding per capita from 2005 to 2009. The national average um, is still a pittance. We, we need a lot more money in graduate medical education uh, to meet the, the growing and expanding healthcare needs in the United States. But look where Nevada rests um, relative to uh, the national average. Uh, Nevada's rank is, is 46th, uh, 46th out of 46 in 05, 06, 07 and they moved up a couple of ticks uh, in 08 and 09. So in 08 and 09, they're a little bit better than Mississippi, and they're, in 2009, they're a little bit better than New Mexico and Mississippi. Now, I spent six years in Tennessee, and Tennessee's saving grace was Mississippi, because whenever statistics on education and healthcare and commerce and race relations and everything else came in, Tennessee could say, see, we are not last. We are not Mississippi. And if Nevada wants to not be Mississippi, continue, uh, uh, continue as uh, you know, the mission you're on. But if you want to do a little better than not Mississippi, and you want to move up this list, and more importantly, you want to get the opportunities to provide funding to train doctors in this state who are going to stay in this state and provide health care to your citizens, to your residents, changes need to be made. And boosting these numbers are a great way to make these changes. And as Paul had mentioned, GME in, in general presents real opportunities in the establishment of a new medical school rather than the expansion uh, within existing medical schools. So I also, um, uh, because most of, obviously most of my work rests in data, I did some data analysis of GME funding. And what it shows is that establishment, uh, establishing medical schools and, and increasing the number of graduates within a state has uh, larger than scale effects on the GME funding that you receive. So um, I'll go through sort of substantively these, uh, uh, these results, but um, a little side for anyone who's interested in the statistical approach. Um, I regress GME funding on population and the number of graduates within a state, and then separately uh, regress GME funding on population and the number of med schools in the state and then separately GME funding on population and the number of public and the number of private med schools in the state. All the data was estimated with ordinary least squares with fixed effects for state and year and state clustered standard errors. So now to the results. So among all states, every additional medical school graduate um, is associated with about a half a million dollars more in GME funding. That's because increasing the number of graduates within a state more than to its individual scale increases the healthcare capacity of that region, of that city, of that area, and you can start training more people. As we, as we discussed earlier, what you start doing is you start importing. You start saying to people, come here, 
Come here for your medical education. Come here for your health care needs. We are able to do a lot more in this city because we have cutting edge research, because we have cutting edge facilities, and people start flowing here, and then the need to train more people in graduate medical education increases. So, uh, so it can have really significant effects. Adding an additional medical school, this is, for, um, uh, this is including all medical schools in the model, um, is associated with an increase of about $41 million in GME funding alone. This isn't NIH funding. These aren't federal grants to study fruit flies and autism. This is graduate medical education funding. And among all states, the um, data also suggests that the addition of either a public or a private medical school is associated with a substantial increase, though, though as it notes, um, that uh, fails to reach significance. So then I, uh, then I argue states like California and Texas um, can be skewing these data. So let's look specifically at states with three or fewer medical schools. These tend to be smaller states. They tend to be more peer-oriented states relative to Nevada. And the results are fairly similar. The numbers are decreased a little, obviously. That makes sense. But the, um, every uh, medical school graduate is associated with an increase in GME funding, though, though the results are a little imprecise. The, uh, every additional medical school generates $26 million in GME funding. Public medical schools, about $20 million in additional uh, GME funding. These are federal dollars that are being thrown away by the state of Nevada by not having another medical school in Las Vegas. This is free money. This is free money to address a serious public policy concern in a state that faces plenty of public policy concerns. And this is a way to do it on the cheap. So here's NIH funding. Uh, the green, sorry the print is so small, it, it was much smaller before my wife, who is a graphic designer, took her, her handiwork at this. So from 2004 to 2013, this shows the mean, the median, and University of Nevada's uh, medical, uh, the Reno Medical School um, in terms of annual NIH funding. Uh, as I said earlier, when you're looking at medical schools, data from medical schools in particular, the mean can very much skew what you're trying to understand because there are such outlier institutions that are getting hundreds of millions of dollars, um, uh, many hundreds of millions of dollars in NIH funds each year. So the median is a better measure of central tendency, a way to understand where your state is, particularly when you're talking about public universities relative to others. Re Reno is, is doing really poorly. That, that's not surprising in terms of annual NIH funds. Great funds. Funds that doctors really work hard to get. Uh, funding that can put you on the map, that can help you get tenure, that can let you do some of the most cutting edge, innovative research done anywhere in the world. Reno's not doing it. Not doing it well. Not, not doing it anywhere near the mean. Uh, for Reno to be doing well, they need everything they're getting now, plus probably another 50 or $60 million every single year from NIH. And that's a problem. Establishing a new medical school may well help Reno uh, boost, because there are ripple effects within local medical economies. But it's also going to mean that for each year, all of the medical schools in the University of Nevada are moving up. And so more funding, more NIH funding is flowing to the state. Part of it has to do with how well faculty recruitment goes, which there's a top-notch team working on that. Doctors are going to bring money with them. Getting top-notch faculty to a, a city like Las Vegas is going to get them not just to bring their NIH funds with them, but then in future years to get more funding These uh, for, for multiple reasons. Uh, uh, NIH funding begets NIH funding. A and so this is a real, uh, obviously there's huge capacity to grow in this state in terms of getting these funds. Uh, uh, the, the current medical school just isn't doing it. It's falling dramatically short. Uh, what needs to happen is Reno needs to start doing better and something, something else needs to come into this state to start helping them do better. And the UNLV medical school uh, may well just be that. So since 2010, NIH funds to new medical schools, excluding the Cleveland Clinic, um, the Learner School there, um, has exceeded $57 million um, in, in NIH funds alone. Here are some of the lists. Um, University of Central Florida is up there. Um, I exclude the Cleveland Clinic because they are such a unique beast um, in, in, in this arena. So uh, the Learner School has taken in about $400 million uh, since uh, this time. 
so excluding them is, is, is important to understand Florida Atlantic, Florida State, um, uh, California Riverside, and other, oh, I'm sorry, $82 million. Since they opened, it's, it's about $400 million. Um, and so a lot of these are what you would consider peer institutions for the new UNLV Medical School. They're public. They are uh, similar in size. They're serving similar universities. And they're new. And so in a very short time, uh, new schools through the hiring of faculty, through the recruiting of faculty, and through um, what the next speaker uh, can obviously talk more to, a really concerted effort to get people who are interested in these funds can do. And so, again, these are millions and millions and millions of dollars being left, uh, left out there by not having a medical school here that will be changed quite soon. So here's the um, Health Resources and Services Administration, another grant-making agency in the context of healthcare. Um, I couldn't fit all, I could fit all 50 states in here. No one would be able to read it, including myself standing this close. But this shows you, in terms of HRSA funding, where Nevada ranks. Not a surprise, 47th in the nation. Um, I forget who's out here. Um, uh, Mississippi is not. This is... Uh, this is active grants by state in terms of dollars. Wyoming is doing poorly. Um, if I remember correctly, everyone out here, almost everyone out here doesn't have a medical school. So Nevada's uh, ranked there compared to obviously California, which is doing well, but compared to other states like Mississippi and like Arizona that only have one medical school. These states are doing all right. Not great, like California or New York, um, but they're doing all right and a lot better than a state like Nevada. So now HRSA dollars per capita, Nevada's last. This is 50 out of 50. DC is excluded from this. Um, Alaska's doing well. We have a lot of reasons to understand why states like Alaska and West Virginia and South Dakota and Alabama do well. They have powerful senators who can earmark funds. Um, and, uh, and I'll give a talk in a couple of days about earmarks um, if any of you would like uh, an encore performance of this. Um, <laughs> But there is something really important to note about the per capita um, funding uh, that you see on this list. In general, and eyeballing the data, uh, the full data set in general, small states are here. They're doing really well in terms of the funds per capita. With the exception of New York, big states are here. Texas, California, Arizona, uh, Pennsylvania. They are st there are states that they're getting a good amount of money, but there's a lot of population to go around. Not here. This is the worst of both worlds. Not a lot of money is flowing out here. And then relative to these other states, it has a small population. Part of the reason for this is that the healthcare market is so small. Not the healthcare market. The training opportunities in healthcare are so small. And the market is being so underserved by what Nevada has to offer. That's why it's out here. And you can think of it again like this. This is money being left at the doorstep of Nevada and being given to other states. Alaska loves taking your HRSA funds off your hands because you're not applying for them and you're not getting them. And Alaska doesn't have a medical school. <laughs> HR, uh, HRSA funding per capita in the Mountain West region. Nevada's obviously last, but last by a lot. There are some things that affect this region because of the region because of where you are, because of population density, because of history, because of representation in Congress, because of your position in presidential politics. There are a lot of reasons why Mountain West states tend to move together. And they move together in a lot of areas. Healthcare funding isn't one of them. States are doing really well, like Montana and New Mexico, and states are doing really, really poorly, like Nevada and no one else on this list. <laughs> So a few conclusions. Um, geographically, Las Vegas is among the most isolated cities for medical training in the United States. And it's among the largest, uh, it, it, by, by the intersection of the two, it is the largest, most isolated uh, city in the United States for medical training. That has serious public policy effects. It has serious economic effects. It has serious academic effects. And it has serious demographic effects. There needs to be a change and the addition of an allopathic medical school in Las Vegas is that change. Training doctors um, in Las Vegas will, will limit the brain drain. That is, Nevadans who want medical training but really have to go somewhere else because one of the smallest medical schools in the United States exists in their state uh, currently. 
In addition, what I found really interesting earlier um, uh, was this idea that, that the new medical school is going to focus in certain areas. Um, that's, that's obviously great. You're going to target and, and come up with a few areas that you're very good at and expand. Well, a lot of those areas, um, primary care, of course, is one, but mental health and, and uh, cardiology, these are areas that have priorities in this administration and in every administration, and it creates real additional funding opportunities. I hope none of this is on the next slide. Um, it creates real additional funding opportunities for the state. Uh, mental health in general was spearheaded more than any other president in our history by George W. Bush. Um, because of uh, 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 family and because of his, his own experiences, he found mental health and addiction services to be absolutely vital. And in uh, areas where he tried to cut funds uh, in, a lot, uh, in, in a lot of healthcare needs, uh, mental health wasn't one of them. And this president has done the same. He's carried that torch. And so targeting your specialties in a medical school toward areas that have consistent prioritization in presidential administrations is, a, is absolutely essential, but it also expands and focuses the opportunities to get money, stop it, to stop money from going to Arizona and California and Alaska and start having it come here. As I said, the ACA also creates additional healthcare demands and additional healthcare needs for a region, but it also creates additional funding opportunities in terms of GME and in terms of other ways to train doctors and to get healthcare into communities. And so in the wake of that, that's what's so exciting about establishing a medical school now, whether it's here, whether it's elsewhere, you're not establishing it and then getting handed the Affordable Care Act and saying, now re-maneuver in a vastly new healthcare market in the United States. They're able to grow as ACA grows, not just since its passage, but as the kinks get worked out over the next several years. And it creates tremendous amounts of private market activity as well. There's a lot of money here for philanthropy. There are a lot of people in this town, obviously you know this, who like their names being on buildings. Uh, we had dinner at the Wynn last night. Um, you can imagine something like that on a, a building or on a school or on a professorship. Um, these are opportunities that uh, Las Vegas residents don't have now. Or, or, well, they have them. They can just name professorships at Loma Linda and at Stanford and at University of Washington. And, and my guess is uh, that's something that they may be interested in. And so, and, and last on this list, as I, as I belabored, the medical school likely increases in dramatic ways the amount of federal funds uh, flying, uh, uh, flowing into a state, the amount of private market activity, and the, amount of, the number of jobs. In the end, Nevada is doing terribly in terms of healthcare funding and in terms of healthcare delivery, and uh, the UNLV Medical School will expand medical training, increase funding opportunities, increase not just the quantity, not just the support for, but also the quality of the research being done in Southern Nevada. And uh, as I mentioned, reform proposals that are in the works, trying to reform uh, Medicare and Medicaid GME will help states like Nevada that have growing populations, that have minority populations, that have true needs, and also has the Senate Majority Leader representing them. Um, those things really help in any reform proposal, and you can bet that it'll help uh, Nevada. Thanks. Uplifting. <laughs> For those of us who love numbers and the whole idea of just building the case that's, that's ironclad, that certainly gave us a lot of more ammunition that was there, or, but certainly framed in a way that many, many can understand. And now we're going to hear from Dr. Deborah um, German who's the Vice President for Medical Affairs and the Dean of the College of Medicine at UCF, which is one of our most favorite examples. I think we've studied it endlessly from beginning to end just because they are, as Rob said, kind of our mirror image, you know, as far as the, their tourism and their, their economy base. So it's really exciting that she was able to come here. Thank you, and I'm looking forward to hearing. Terrific. Well, it's, it's a pleasure to be with you today, and it looks like 
the majority of our time has been spent trying to convince you that UNLV uh, Las Vegas needs a medical school. Just so that I can organize my comments, are there any of you in the room now who feel that that's not the case, that UNLV and Las Vegas does not need a medical school? Can I see a show of hands? OK. One? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> One? OK, so when we get to question and answers, I really want you to ask me a lot of questions. Does that mean I'll be allowed to ask the questions unlike I was a year ago? <laughs> I don't know. I, see, I'm from another place, so everything's possible with me. You know, we're from uh, Orlando, and La Orlando's the place where dreams come true. And we're very much like, like Las Vegas. We take care of, of kids and families. And as I see it, you take care of adults and families. So I think there's a lot that we share in common. So my job today is to talk to you about building the UCF College of Medicine and Health Sciences campus. But I'm really going to ask you to listen with bigger ears, no, no, no pun intended, bigger ears than just building the College of Medicine. Because really what we're doing in Central Florida is we're transforming healthcare. And we're transforming the lives of everyone who lives there. And people who live in communities that have limited medical services, what we have is good, but it's limited, don't know what they're missing. And you really don't know until you or someone you love very much gets sick. Because most of us, when we're healthy, don't really know what the health care provision is like in our city. So I want to tell you, you're missing something, and you don't know what it is. But you can fix that. So let me get started. Just to give you my background, I didn't look to see what was in there in my bio. I'm a practicing rheumatologist. That's an arthritis and immune disease doctor. I got my MD at Harvard Medical School. I uh, did my training residency at Rochester, fellowship at Duke. I was an associate dean at Duke senior associate dean at Vanderbilt, a hospital CEO, a Petersdorf scholar. So I've been in academic medicine pretty much my whole career. And at this point in my career, I felt like I was still young enough to do some more work. My youngest daughter had gone off to law school. My former husband had passed away. And there I was. Do I retire? And the, the thought of retiring just didn't fit with my personality. And I went looking for a great adventure. When I saw this, I recognized my great adventure. This is 7,000 acres of land with nothing on it. And do any of you know what this is? It's the Orlando International Airport, a global destination for tourism. Okay? I asked myself, where else in this country are you going to find 7,000 acres of land immediately adjacent to an airport that's already a global destination for tourism. And those 7,000 acres of land want to become a medical city. The developer of the land had been trying for years to get biotech to come. And guess what? He couldn't get it. Scripps went to Torrey Pines in Florida. People just wouldn't come to this vast swamp right next to the airport. Well, they did a little study. They went all over the country. And here's what they learned. In order to build a medical city, you need the anchor tenant, just like a shopping mall, right? If you have a shopping mall and you don't have a Neiman's or a Penny's or a Macy's or a Sears, you're not going to get the store that sells shoes, the store that sells jewelry. You need the big store that does it all. And then the little stores come, right? Well, a medical city is just like that. You need a medical school. Why? Because a medical school does it all. We train the students and the residents. We practice medicine. And we do research. We do all of those things. What is a medical city? It's biomedical research institutes. It's hospitals, clinics, practices, specialties, subspecialties, and the training of doctors, nurses, and everybody. That's what a medical city is here. You have pieces of that already. 
Well, in any case, and I want to call your attention because my last slide, I want you to notice we built our school right here. I'll show it to you on the next slide. But I want to point out that the, fl the planes follow this path. And there's a reason that they fly right over our school. So what we have here is something, and what I could see when I looked at this was the future. What I saw was this century's premier medical school anchoring the best medical city in the country that would one day be a global destination for research, patient care, and education. And I went there because I felt like I was young enough that I needed a life project to work on. And I wanted to attract my family to wherever I went, and I now have all of that in one place. Okay, so let's fast forward. This, is, this was taken in 2007. I arrived in Orlando in December of 06. And so I, I like to say I got started in earnest in January of 07 because you know what the holidays are like. You just can't get anybody to do anything anywhere. Um, so here we are in 2007. Now we're gonna fast forward to 2014. This is just seven years down the road. Swampland, nothing on it, nothing even slated to come. Now, the Nemours Foundation, the, DuPont, the Nemours Hospital, Nemours Children's Hospital, the DuPont Foundation out of Delaware was looking for a place somewhere in Florida to build a freestanding children's hospital. They too could see the future. They built it in our medical city. We now have a fully operational children's hospital that, and, and the physicians in that hospital, UCF College of Medicine faculty. The VA, we were a very large city, city with a large number of veterans. The VA was looking for a place to build a VA hospital, which would be the second largest in the country. And they had land 20 miles away from our medical city. What did the VA do once they knew the medical school was going to be there and we started building? They could see the future too. This is the VA, it will open in January, okay? There's a little plot of land here, another segment of the VA, was looking for a place somewhere in the country to build a national simulation center. This is a place that will create the simulation programs and train every person who works in every VA across this country on the things that need to be standardized. They looked all over the country, they narrowed it down to two places, Palo Alto, Stanford, nearby, and Orlando, Lake Nona Medical City. Where did they build that uh, simulation center? We, we broke ground on it actually uh, two weeks ago. It, it's coming out of the ground here. Why? They could see the future. Can you see my shopping mall? We got our anchor tenant, the medical school. Can you see what's happening here? Okay, the Burnham Institute, now Sanford Burnham, a biomedical research institute located in La Jolla, California, looking for an East Coast branch somewhere up and down the East Coast, searching and searching. They could see the future. They too are located right here. The, the scientists who work there on the UCF faculty. And by the way, the physicians who practice here on the UCF faculty. One of the most important things that you'll hear in what I say is partnership. Last but not least, and my favorite partner of all, and I think there are some similarities here, the University of Florida, Gainesville, kind of a small town, kind of far away from us, the flagship university of the state of Florida with a great medical school many miles away. President Bernie Matchin started to see what was happening here. He could have built a branch of his medical school here in Orlando, and by the way, Florida State University has a branch of their medical school in Orlando. President Matchin at the University of Florida could see the future and he wanted to be part of it. So what he built is a branch of his pharmacy school and a research building in our medical city. And you know what? We welcome him, we partner with him because geography means everything. The people in Orlando the businesses in Orlando, the philanthropy in Orlando, they're not going to give money to the University of Florida. They're not going to give money to Florida State because they're not there. 
they're going to give their money to the University of Central Florida. We call ourselves the hometown university. And what we're going to do is be good stewards of that money and partner with our sister institutions across the state to bring advantage to all of us. And you, you can either think about this as war, or you can think about this as family. And I like to use the family analogy because it gets us down the road faster. Look what we've done in seven short years, okay? Seven short years, we have a medical city. And by the way, we're also partnering with the second and ninth largest health systems in the country. The Florida um, Adventist System, Florida Hospital, and Orlando Health. And actually, we're partnering with HCA. We just built a residency with them, but I'll tell you about that in a minute. Okay, you've seen a lot of this. I didn't know how much was going to be presented, but I do want to just show you. This comes from the uh, AAMC report on uh, the economic impact of member uh, schools and teaching hospitals. And Florida is now ranked number eighth in the country in total economic impact of its medical schools. We were ninth when I came on board. So we've moved up a notch, which is quite nice. And the average per medical school here is about um, $5 billion in total economic impact. Now this is a little bit misleading because it's the average impact of the top 10. So the information you saw on your prior slides are, are more likely what you will achieve, but look what you can achieve if you do it in partnership. We had an economic impact study done before we built our medical school, and here's what it showed, and we're well on our way. That according to, it was done in 2008, so it was a little after I arrived, and by 2017, we would create the, the extended economic impact, 30,000 jobs, 460 million in annual tax revenue, 2.8 billion in wages, 7.6 billion in annual economic impact activity, and of course, uh, a return of $13.5 uh, uh, for every dollar spent. So, and we're moving forward, we're making it happen. And honestly, I think one of the questions that was asked is what's preventing us from do it, based, doing it? Based on what I've heard here today, you have the people, you have the dollars, and it looks like for the most part, except for one, and we'll, we'll talk later, you have the will, so I would say there's nothing preventing you from doing it, and this is my favorite part, roll up your sleeves and get it done. There's more than economic impact, and again, others have mentioned this. It, it improves the delivery and quality of health care. You won't notice this. this is, you, you won't notice it, but 10 years from now, you'll know it. Okay? You won't notice it happening, but it will happen. It, you will attract Healthcare and biomedical industry, you saw the slide that showed them physically coming. You will attract talented physicians and scientists. You will, if you create this, people will come from other states. My goal is to build the best one in the nation. I want to be a magnet for the best faculty and students, scientists and clinicians from all over the country. And the way I look at it is if you're going to do something, you might as well set an impossibly high goal because then you figure out what you're capable of. If I just, and, and when the president offered me this, this job, I, I had one question for him. I said, at that time there were 128 US allopathic LCME accredited medical schools. And I said, are we gonna just build number 129 or are we gonna do this better than it's ever been done before? And if he had said just 129, I would have said, thank you, I'm not interested in this job. But he said, whatever you want, and that's been, you know, created the most fun. And I would say, allow the folks who are building your medical school the opportunity to dream and to create and to have the freedom to build something wonderful. Uh, there are enough restrictions by the accrediting agencies that keep us in a box. And when you go outside of your box, you can do amazing things. And again, you can see here, um, you can become a medical destination. And I think if Orlando has that opportunity, oh my God, think what Las Vegas can do in terms of becoming a medical destination. You are already so much more of a destination than probably almost any other city in this country. I, I think it's unbelievable. As a matter of fact, I want to partner with you 
when you get this going. I want to partner with you. And if you don't do this, I want all your donors to come to Orlando and give me the money that they're going to give to you. <laughs> OK, timeline. This seems like an impossible job, but the reality is nothing's impossible if you want to do it. And by the way, when, when the search was going on for the dean of, of, of the medical school, this, the position that I now hold, there were five finalists. Three dropped out. They said it couldn't be done. There wasn't enough time, and there wasn't enough money. So when the search agent called me and said, oh, I'm afraid you're going to drop out too. Everybody's dropping out. I said, are you kidding? I said, they just made it for me. Because here's the reality. If I bring this medical school in on time, I'm a hero. We had three experts tell us it couldn't be done. And if I'm a year late, I just say to my community, look, we knew it couldn't be done. I just did what was possible. So in any case, let me just share with you a little bit about making the impossible the inevitable. I was hired on 12-1. And as I said, I, I think of myself as getting started on January 1st of 2007. When you back up from the promise that was made, let's see, where is it? By our president to the legislature that the first class would begin in August of 09. When you back up what's required, preliminary accreditation, the submission, and then the, uh, an additional submission, I had 90 days from the time that we paid our money to the LCME and they gave us the, uh, uh, the requirements, I had 90 days to get the entire plan for the medical school together. And at that time, the College of Medicine had one employee. So imagine yourself recognizing that those three people who said it was impossible were actually right. You know, there were 90 days to get it done. So I went to our president and I said, look, these are the rules. This is what we have to do. We have to meet the promise that you made to the legislature. We have to. And the only way I can do this is if you make this entire university at my disposal. And he did. And I sat with the finance people. I sat with the diversity people. I sat with the curricular people. I sat with the faculty promotion and tenure people. And we wrote a first draft of the medical school by me talking with them and them writing a first draft. And, ne and it has been a wonderful thing. We had a 68-person curriculum committee. There were philosophers, lawyers, business people, people like some of you in the room. There was no one on the committee except me who'd ever really been in academic medicine before. But we came out with something that is stunning and spectacular, and I'm looking forward to showing it to you. But there's a complex timeline here. And again, I, I credit our president and our provost at saying, look, Deb, you're the expert here. Whatever you need, we're behind you. And if you can do that, and if you hire the right people, you're going to have this most amazing experience. All right. One of the things that was important um, is this. If you're building this century's best medical school, you have to have this century's best people. And you can get those people from your own state, but you have to keep them from going elsewhere. And the way I thought about it, so I went to Harvard Medical School. It, it wasn't my first choice. As a matter of fact, I turned them down the first time they offered me admission. But they offered me a full scholarship, spending money, and travel. And I come from a family where you know, nobody had finished four years of college before, and we didn't have a lot of resources. So ultimately, that took me to Harvard Medical School. So I started thinking, how can I start off with the best possible students? And the only way I could think of was to pay back what had been paid to me, pay it forward, to our first class of 40 students. So I raised money. We raised money so that every student in the charter class went to medical school all four years free. And it took me a year to raise that money. And people said I was crazy because they said, who wants to pay money so that people can grow up to be rich doctors without debt? Well, we started. I used to give talks. This is my favorite slide. In my first year in this role, I had this slide. And as I got the scholarships, we would color in the white coats. And I would say, here's where we are. And I, I'll tell you, people come up to me to this day and say, when you came to our community, I heard you give one of these presentations. And I whispered to my husband, she won't last six months. So there, there was a lot of, um, uh, I guess, 
uh, thank you, skepticism about this, but it happened. So let me show you a nice little story here. Not only did we raise money for the 40, but people were so excited about being part of this that I had people calling me saying, do you have 40 yet? Our board's not meeting until Friday and we don't want to miss out. I ended up with 41 scholarships. Now we'd only been approved to accept 40 in our charter class. So I had to call the LCME and I called them up and I spoke to Barbara and Dan and I said, the, the two secretaries of the LCME, and I said, can we admit 41 students? And they said to me, are you in trouble? Whenever a dean calls and asks to admit more students than they've been approved for, it's because they're running short on funds and they need those tuition dollars. And I started to laugh and I said, no, I said, the problem I have is I have 41 full scholarships for all four years and I don't want to disappoint one of my donors. They said they'd never in the history of the LCME had a request like that and of course I could admit 41 students. So that's what we did. And again, it illustrates another point. Geography is meaningful. The people in Orlando wanted UCF, their hometown university, to have a medical school. And these are people, individuals, who stepped up to the plate and gave so that they could sponsor a medical student through all four years. And we got off to a beautiful start. Again, I'll, I'll get there. And I'm sorry, I got started 30 minutes late. I'm going to try to keep us on time. OK. Oh, okay, okay. So I want to show you some of our achievements. Um, 2007, our medical school, I had a 10 by 12 foot office, very nice, 120 square feet. The program was an idea, and there was one employee in the College of Medicine. Now, you are probably a little bit ahead of that now. That's exactly, I have. <laughs> Not 120 square feet. I think it's more like you have a 100. smaller office? Okay. <laughs> well, this is Las Vegas, so I think they need to give you a bigger office right away. How embarrassing. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so, 2007. Now, move forward. Again, it's seven years. It's not that much time. It really isn't that much time. We occupy almost 500,000 square feet of space, and we've built two of the buildings, but we're in more than two buildings. Well, actually, we've built more than that. We've built a number of buildings. We have created a residency program in internal medicine. We've just admitted our first 16 residents, and we are partnering with community hospitals, and they have increased the numbers of residents they have. I think we have maybe added uh, about 150 residents to Orlando's portfolio, and there are about 100 more to come. We're working on an emergency medicine residency, and we're working on some others. Central Florida affiliations, we have 36. We are the partnership university. We've actually trademarked that expression, so we, we, we now own it. And we are partnered with all of the hospitals, all of the clinics, all of the research institutes, and welcoming them and their professionals to be on our faculty. And they can be on the faculty of two medical schools or two universities. It's not an exclusive thing. I want to keep, I want to make sure that it's clear that building this doesn't mean not loving the other things that you have in your state. Think of it as a family, not as a war. Okay. Um, Faculty and staff, I've hired 572 people, faculty and staff, and they're working really hard to make this, this century's premier medical school in a medical city that will one day be a global destination for everyone. Um, we have over 2,000 volunteer faculty. What does that mean? These are physicians and scientists who are already in Orlando, who were working in the hospitals and the clinics there who absolutely love being part of what we're doing. And some of them are physicians who are also on the faculty at Florida State and at the University of Florida. And you know what? That's okay. All right. 
scholarships, I've already told you about that. We've graduated 91 students so far, and we've built our UCF faculty practice. Let me just tell you about this graduation. Every one of our students has matched, and last year when we graduated our second largest class, our second class of 60 students, all of them matched, and the ones who wanted to stay in Florida did. The ones who wanted to go away went to places like the Mass General, Hopkins, Vanderbilt, Emory, you get the Stanford, you get the picture. We're doing really well. Nationally, last year, there were 400 graduates of US medical schools who did not match. None of them were UCF graduates. So those are our achievements. Educational programs. We're bigger than just the MD program. I've already mentioned, right now we have 419 students enrolled in all, across all four years. Our, our steady state class size is 120. And we now have two classes that are at 120. Our ramp up was like this, 41, 60, 80, 100, 120 and now we're at 120. So currently we have 419 MD students enrolled. I told you about the 16 internal medicine residents. What I didn't tell you about is that we are responsible for the School of Biomedical Sciences, which is a part of the College of Medicine. And it teaches the undergraduates at the University of Central Florida. It trains them in medical laboratory sciences, uh, microbiology, molecular biology. So I have in my college, 2,866 <laughs> bachelor degree candidates and 98 master's and PhD candidates. So the College of Medicine has 3,399 students enrolled in it. It's a little different model. I'm not suggesting that you go to that model, but we're all about the pipeline to medical school and enhancing the ability for our own students, our own children, to have the right kind of education from day one. I want to jump in and say that um, we talked about this last night at dinner. This medical school of the 13 new medical schools has the highest economic impact. And uh, we measure all the uh, medical schools every year. And her medical school in only seven years has a $450 million impact on Florida. And that's about twice as much as the current medical school here within only seven years. So this is big economic impact. Just wanted to jump in oh, with you. Thank, you. thank uh, you. I'll give you a breath a little bit. No, that's uh, awesome. Well, I didn't know that and, and until you told me. And I think that um, make sure that everyone who does this loves doing it. That's the most important thing. And, and I'll tell you, well, so these are our educational programs. So if I were you, I would be asking, okay, you've got this medical school dean in front of you talking about all this stuff, but can you really deliver? Well, yeah, maybe we have all those things there, but how are our students doing, right? I mean, our, our core mission at its heart is to train young people to become medical doctors. And are you doing a good job or are you just talking about it? Well. There aren't a lot of measures, national measures, that allow you to assess that, but there are a few. One is the United States Medical Licensing Exam that students take at the end of their second year and then uh, at the end of their clinical years. And it's two steps. One is basic science, knowledge, and the other is clinical. So we can look at our performance and how we compare to the rest of the nation in that. And then the other measure is the National Board of Medical Examiners subject exams that all medical students across the country take after they do their clerkships in these individual um, specialties. So I'm gonna show you how we're doing. Okay, first, United States Medical Licensing Exam, step one, basic science, and step two, clinical knowledge scores. So these are average step one scores, the white, represents each year, uh, 2013, 14, 15, and 16. This hasn't come out yet. We don't know where it is, but it generally ranges right in this area, okay? The white is the national average. The gold is how our first four classes have done on this exam. Now, what I wanna say to you is, what are the odds 
that you would create a brand new untested program with a hodgepodge of people that you've hired and that out of the box, the very first time, you would be almost at the national average, meaning that you've probably beat out, oh, I don't know, 60 other US medical schools in your students' performance. When I saw that, I was delighted. Remember, I was absolutely compelled to raise money for those scholarships because if I didn't, I was afraid I was gonna start out with a class that couldn't get in anywhere else because you've heard earlier that a medical school can't be fully accredited until that first class is in their fourth year, right? And if they get to the fourth year and that medical school is not accredited, then they can't do residencies. And if they can't do residencies, they can't practice medicine. So the way I looked at my medical school is I would never have applied there. I wouldn't apply to an untested medical school and risk my future on it. And so to have such a school come in here was great, but little did I realize how intense my faculty felt about being the best and my students. We are now, I, I know because in my years at Vanderbilt and at Duke when I was an associate dean, I used to look at these scores. I think we may be in the top quarter of the country. They only give you the, the, the mean, the average. They don't give you the top quartile, so I don't know that. But this is pretty impressive. And in the clinical scores, which is really where the rubber hits the road, we have never been anything but exquisite. And I've had people who sit on the national board come and tell me, they won't tell me how we're doing exactly, but they always come and say, wow, we were stunned by the way your medical school came out of the box. So I'm very pleased with this. This is USMLE. Next, National Board of Me Medical Examiners, subject exams. In the third year, medical students do rotations in pediatrics, OBGYN, neurology, psychiatry, surgery, and medicine. The white bar is the national average, all medical students across the country. The gold bar is how our students have done. And yes, our students are doing way better than the national average. And now that I've shown you the first slide, you're just going, so I knew that. Mm -hmm. But here's the thing that stuns me. We're doing better than the national average in every single discipline. And I think there's something in our water. I'm not sure. <laughs> but, you know, there's something there, and it probably exists in, in, in Las Vegas, too. But in any case, this is how we've done. Now, research, we've talked a lot about research. We put together these five areas of focus, and in 2013, we had $8.4 million in research, which is about what um, the state has, I think, for, for your current medical schools, is, is around $10 million. Is that right? So we're doing pretty well, given that, again, we're just getting started. And we haven't started, I haven't started yet, to focus my full attention on research. Now that we've graduated our classes, we're fully accredited, now I'm going to push in that area and in the clinical areas. So stay tuned, this is number is going to grow. Patient care, this is opening day at our fledgling UCF Pegasus Health practice. We built a multi-special faculty practice where the faculty who are hands-on teachers can actually practice medicine. And these are the specialties that we have to date. We're expanding it and we're partnering with our local physicians and our local practices as we do this. Our goal, again, is not to come in and take things away. It's to come in and be a partner. And many of the folks who have been in Orlando all their lives are loving the fact that they get to play with us now. This is a, a slide, it's, I think uh, you've seen it in another form, and I just wanted to make a point. Uh, the latest uh, revenue data that I could get, and, and you may have more recent data, was the 2011-12, and it came out of the AAMC data book of 2013. And what this shows is the percent funding of the average public medical school revenue. And I always say when I show this slide, don't let this fool you. I'm not putting this up here because we aspire to be average, okay? That's not why the slide is up here. But what it says is that the average public medical school has $600 million in revenue. And that do those dollars get spread across the city. I mean, people are 
having jobs and, and spending that money. Our college in 11-12 was up to 58.8 million. We're at about 60 in the low 60s right now. But the reason I like to show this slide in our community is because we're fully accredited and we've had some success, I don't want our community and our donors to think we're done because sometimes they go on to the next thing. We're only a tenth what an average medical school would be, and we aspire to be great. So when you think about what you're doing here, it is a long-term project, but it will bring back returns beyond your wildest dreams. We are a partner. We partner with healthcare facilities and systems in our area, and what I thought I do, would do is just list some of the major partnerships that we have clinically so that you could see it. And if there are any clinical partners in the room, don't be afraid of a new medical school. All right, before I start this, I'm gonna set this up for you. Um, you, you. You start off with a dream and you want to do something well. Okay, and you don't really know how it's going to turn out. You just know that you do your best and you just see where it lands. And what you're going to see in a few minutes is Dr. Ben Sachs. Ben is a person who spent most of his career, a physician who spent most of his career at Harvard. And then eight years ago, a little over eight years ago, went to Tulane immediately after Katrina when Tulane was completely and totally destroyed. And over the eight years following Katrina, built it back to life. He completed that job, went back to Harvard, and now has been um, uh, employed, in much the way that Dr. Atkinson has been employed here, to help the US Virgin Islands build a new medical school. Now, the US Virgin Islands is not an offshore foreign medical school, it is like Hawaii, like Las Vegas, like Orlando, a medical school that is in the US and needs to be accredited by the LCME. So Ben searches the entire country, looks at all 141 US medical schools because he thinks, why reinvent the wheel? Why don't we just find what the best is, start with that and build from there? So he looks nationally. He narrows it down to seven, and he goes and studies those in depth. What he does is looks at um, their classes, uh, gets into their online material, and a variety of other things. And he's now picked one to be his medical school. And of course, since I'm talking about it, you know it's UCF. But I do want to show you a little interview that he did talking about it. After visiting many medical schools for this project, I've come to the conclusion, and I will recommend to the president of the university, that this medical school, your medical school, is the most progressive that we've come across. Many medical schools that I approach, they're stuck in uh, old ways, and their faculty is stuck in old ways. I don't see that here at all. We think that you are um, amazing and I just would like to congratulate you, and that's from a perspective of having compared you to many other places. It's really your integrated curriculum led by passionate faculty with incredible support by professionals, educational experts, and other people that led us to the conclusion that you're the right partner. We spent some time in the classrooms, and I was stunned to see your classrooms full. Today is Friday afternoon for a three-day weekend, your classrooms are full. Most medical schools I've ever been associated with and I've taught at, you're lucky to get 30% of the class showing up. A lot of what you are doing in the classroom and what we have been seeing is, is, has really piqued my interest and it's really impressive. You're really building lifelong learners. You're getting students to take responsibility for each other, team players. It is our privilege to be here today. You are an amazing medical school and you should take great pride of what you've accomplished. So, so let me be clear, I didn't show that because I'm trying to say that you should come and, and partner with us, although 
they're, they're willing to pay us a lot of money for our curriculum, which is, it's more than our research dollars in a year. So just to give you a sense of what it's worth. Um, but I did show it to you for this reason, and I want to be clear about it. I showed it to you because when you build something new from scratch, it's easier to build it better than it is when you take something old and try to remodel it or try to replace it. And we're the proof of that. And it's one thing for someone to stand in front of you and say that. Some of you will believe it and some of you will not. But I did want to show you what we've done so that you could at least see that in one case, it, it, it is true. I end every presentation I give with this slide and I have to tell you about it. Do you remember the first slide? I showed you where the medical school was in the runway. Okay. Well, we designed and built this building. And by the way, I fired the first architect and two decorators along the way because it <laughs> was not going to be an inspirational building. And we, we got something we liked. And then I was dreaming about how to thank all of our donors for what they had done to get us launched. And I said, you know, most of us do. We go to a hotel. We have a silent auction and a live auction and a dinner and everyone is similar. So let's do something different. We invited them into our building and had an open house. Our first class of students gave tours and all of the hotels and restaurants in the area donated food. So as you walked on each floor, there was the Ritz Carlton dessert room, you know, the Disney this and the Universal Studios that and uh, the Ruth's Chris steak. And so it was a, a progressive dinner as you wandered through the College of Medicine. And as I was dreaming about this with my team, I said, you know, when you have an open house, the big problem is getting people to leave when it's over. So what I'd like to do at the end is have an orchestra playing the 1812 overture with fireworks that will get everyone out of the building and we can say good night. And my team reminded me that we were directly on the path of the airport and there was no way we could ever do fireworks. So I, I was really sad about that. Next thing I know, all the things I talked about inside the building are going on. See these white cones right here? These little white cones? That's the backdrop of a stage. The UCF orchestra is sitting on that stage playing the 1812 overture. See these fireworks? They're not Photoshopped. They were donated by SeaWorld. But the most important thing of all, standing right here, one of our team with a headset on, in constant communication that night, with the control tower at the airport because, <laughs> because the FAA had given permission for flights to be diverted for three hours from that runway oh. so that we could have our party. And so I'm gonna end with this statement. There is nothing you can't accomplish if you partner. Thank you for your time. So it's, um, we're going to have question and answer time. If all of the speakers could come up front. And for those who are asking questions, please make sure that you get the mic um, so that, oh, I should be in the mic. Please make sure that you're in the mic so that it can be heard both in the room and on the video. And then this is for everybody who's not. Mic too. That's OK. Well, we're catching up. I think Joe should ask. <laughs> <laughs> got the mic. Um, King Agrippa told Paul, thou almost convinced me to be a Christian. Um, that's uh, neither here nor there, but I appreciate the Florida experience, the hometown medical school experience. Uh, these are questions that I still am concerned about, the clinical, and you don't have to answer them. You can do that sometime. The clinical clerkships of the third and fourth years obviously are important to have the community uh, physicians uh, with buy-in to that and the hospitals have buy-in to that and we've had some challenge with that uh, heretofore. Uh, the impact on UNSUM, University of Nevada School of Medicine obviously uh, is uh, a player that has to be uh, considered with the investment that we have in the state of Nevada. 
we heard the word allopathic and um, I, I was curious about uh, the data on the allopathic private research school, how that will uh, affect because we heard the public part of that. Um, GME, the residents end up teaching the medical students and so your clerkships and the residents go hand in hand and therefore we have to have that discussion about the GME availability. Uh, the comparison of an osteopathic school um, with a private allopathic school I think is something that we haven't heard about the research and the economic impact. And likewise at the same time you have a private allopathic school and a public allopathic school rolling out. Uh, do we have that model anywhere and how that affects the GME availability uh, in the area and how to teach the medical students? It is a universal concept and truism that we need more doctors in the, uh, in the United States and in Nevada. The Caribbean schools, um, that foreign school that we said was a foreign school and not a Virgin Island type school uh, and the availability of those residents to be taught and the uh, Caribbean schools that have been buying up GME uh, programs and hospitals as it were. Um, every state when you look at what it needs uses the term we need uh, loan repayment and scholarships uh, to describe how we get more doctors in every state. Uh, and I appreciate your patience because I'm still going on. Um, as I see it, when we speak, when we talk of biennial budgets, we talk of a about an $85 million budget now uh, for UNLV, an $85 million budget now for UNSUM, and um, we are now currently uh, paying our students uh, to leave Nevada. That's basically what we're doing with UNSUM. And uh, where do you get the students? Uh, because that uh, scholarship program that you had was marvelous. I think it was um, uh, tremendous what you suggested. And uh, bottom line is, as we look at the residency slots that are going to exist in 2017, we're going to have more uh, U.S. medical students graduating than we have residency slots that are even currently now being used as uh, for the foreign medical graduates. And those are the only questions I have today. Thank you. I don't know even where to begin except that we need to meet and talk some more because <laughs> each of those questions has a complicated answer besides, um, I, I, I guess it boils down to, I'll start with the GME part. We have to add GME, there's no question about that. And we need to be adding it as quickly as we can because we don't have enough kinds of things being trained. And, and Toro needs more spots. Roseman is going to need spots. We're going to need <coughs> spots if we want to keep people in Nevada. So we definitely have to work on that, no question about it. And, and we can start that work tomorrow. That's not something that's going to take the school being started in order to do it. But we need to work together to do it. I think what you've done is you've raised all of the detailed issues about which a community has fear when such an idea comes. And it's, it shows your passion, it shows your attention to this. So I'm impressed with your questions and, and thank you for them. What I would like to suggest though is a shift in the way that you think. And because when, you're, when, when a new opportunity comes, you can look at it from the point of view of all of the, the problems that it will create, and you should. And you can look at it from the point of view of all the opportunities it will bring, and you should do that too. And depending on where you are, you're going to settle in one camp or another. And in my experience, when we're focused on the things that are our challenges and see them in a fearful way that leads us to say we can't move in this new direction or this progressive direction, it often uh, comes because of a, um, a, a, 
a, a lack of understanding of the, what the opportunity really has. And I, I think there's a kind of courage and a leap of faith that's, because you won't be able to answer, and, and I just want to be honest, you won't be able to answer all of those questions. And I think you need to reframe the way you think about it from either or, the, the kind of war model, to the and model, which is not the either or, but the and model. And it's kind of like, is the glass half empty or full? Or it has to do with, um, you know, the pie. Can you expand the pie, or do you want just a piece of the pie? I think if you look at the pie as not able to be expanded, then I would sit down with you and talk with you for hours about every one of those details and want to make sure all of those were addressed. But I think this is a pie-expanding endeavor, and I think it requires a different way of thinking. I won't answer all of your questions. I, we'd be here until tomorrow if we did, but I'd be happy to talk to you as well about any ones in particular that, that you would like. I would just say, uh, I don't know which mic is working. Oh. <laughs> so what I would say in terms of your questions about funding, and that, that's all I'll, I will touch on, is that uh, there's a perspective about federal funding and, and really private funding as well that sees a new medical school as a competitor for existing med medical schools in the region, and although there's very little in terms of medical schools in the region, at least allopathic ones. I and that's the wrong approach. If, if UNLV, or when UNLV establishes a medical school, it's not really going to take money out of the hands and the mouths of what's happening at the university uh, medical school in Reno. What's going to happen is you're going to be competing maybe for faculty, maybe not. My guess is someone who wants to live in Reno isn't necessarily the same person who wants to live in Las Vegas. But there will be, th there will be independent efforts to get funding, and that funding is, not, is limited in scope, and federal funding is limited in scope in terms of a whole budget for an agency or for a program. But it's not, well, Reno got this money, Las Vegas can't. And in a lot of ways, my, my research suggests this, there's a lot of reasons why the federal government would look at this and say, Reno got this money and Las Vegas should too. Mm -hmm. Because there are a lot of reasons in terms of representation in Congress, in terms of the fact that Nevada is a swing state. Um, there are a lot of reasons why Nevada should be getting more federal funding. The Lindsay Institute produced a report that showed it on formula funds, which are among the easiest funds in the nation to get from, uh, in terms of federal funding, Nevada's last, dead last in terms of getting formula grants. That's not going to change by some change in mindset or change in view. It's going to change with investment and effort and intuition about federal funding opportunities and intuition about what the requirements of getting uh, formula funding, competitive funding, block grant funding, uh, cooperative agreement funding. Um, Understanding that, understanding what is going on in those programs and what Nevada needs to do to get that is what's going to happen. And expanding the intellectual and academic capacity to tackle those questions is not something that happens in a state legislative office or a cabinet office. It's what happens in the institutions that are going to be applying for those funds and the, the historical understanding and the experience that faculty and administrators bring with them to the new positions to be able to achieve these things. And so pitting Reno against Las Vegas and their associated medical schools is an absolutely backwards and, and, and false narrative and, and, and uh, framing. It's really two partners, though in many ways completely independent, not as linked as we think of as branch campuses in states, <coughs> very independent entities working together not to help themselves but to help Nevada and to help the market here and to help the delivery of health care. just want to say that uh, we've had five uh, osteopathic schools that we've helped get started in America and a couple new ones, one in Las Cruces, New Mexico, one in Jonesboro, Arkansas, Dothan, Alabama, I'm going to forget a few but I want to bring up two that are really interesting that might help with the question. Um, Ohio State University and the Cleveland Clinic now have osteopathic medical schools on their same campus. Uh, we work with Ohio University and they look to expand 
on the campus of Ohio State, but also on the campus of the Cleveland Clinic. Cleveland Clinic now has three medical schools, the Case one, the Learner one, and now the osteopathic one at Ohio University. There's a new movement in American medical education to partnerships, just as Deb has mentioned, where working together, there's so much more benefit to really grow the and to achieve the, the answer to the questions. I wanna also just say that as I look at the future, I look at the future of medical education being not in one camp or another camp, but there's a lot of movement toward them becoming one camp. And when I look down even further in the future, I see the need for these partnerships to be able to solve the needs that you have. So when you look at the staggering data today, it will take a bunch of medical schools, including what you're seeing in Phoenix, where there's now more collaboration between the osteopathic and the allopathic schools, more that than one versus another. Yeah, and just to wrap this, there's 13 new medical schools that were founded since 2000. If I'm not mistaken, they haven't cut a nickel into the existing medical schools. In fact, if you look at America at mid 21st century, you're looking at 400 million residents and we're on track for that. You're going to need 20 more medical schools. Guess what? Spokane should get one. They're in a debate right now. They're getting one. They're getting one. Here's what's going on there. They have this state where three quarters of the people live in the Puget Sound and one quarter live in the interior, the Inland Empire, as they call it, of Washington State. And this is a rational discussion. Should the state's second largest cluster of population receive a medical school? You saw how far away it was from John's slides from the main medical school. Should Spokane, and I'd say yes, they should, and they are, and there's some controversy. UW's complaining a bit about it. Here's the Nevada discussion. A quarter of the state has the medical school could three quarters of the state have a medical school? <laughs> the Washington discussion is so rational, it makes me want to cry. <laughs> the Nevada discussion is only in Nevada. Question? Thank you. Oh. I have a, more like a um, one, it's to the Brookings report. You, you said several times, it's free money, it's free money. Actually, some of the money that's distributed is not at all free money, we paid it. I, it's not free money. It's money I write a check and it says U.S. Treasury. I may as well write dash Alaska next to it because it is my state's money that we are choosing to give away to another state. So this is not free money. It's not like the U.S. government's printing it. It's my money. It's your money. So put a different hat on when you write that check next year or right now and say, I'd like to keep the piece that I'm writing where it belongs. Okay, so I want to go to your, your, your part pie chart, the Brookings pie chart, where you discuss where the money's coming from to focus um, our attention on, on how I think things are going to roll out. So if you looked at it, it had the height, 5% coming from in um, grant, not grants, it said 5% um, from philanthropy. We'll just use that word for lack of a better word. I'm going to speak on behalf of the philanthropists then. Then why are we being asked for the largest percentage of this conversation. Right now this community is talking about, you. I'm gonna tell you what they're saying. You will not get a medical school unless you come up to Reno with $200 million. Yeah. Um, no, according to that pie chart, uh, if it's 200 million that you need, then you really only need 10 from philanthropy. So why is the conversation so skewed? We need to readjust the conversation because if that is what Carson City is saying, then this conversation, everyone in this room doesn't need to be here. It's legislators, it's your governor, it's your provost, it's the president of your university. That's who needs to be sitting in this room because going up there thinking that if we bring a pot of money, they can't say no to us is not the way this should work. According to every piece of data, the way it should work is philanthropy is the icing on the cake. It's not your cake. And I'm afraid that we've spent our time and our resources discussing this instead of our time and, and, and philanthropy. Let me tell you what goes on outside this room. It's who's going to pay for it. Is Mr. Kerkorian going to pay for it? Is Adelson going to pay for it? How about the state of Nevada, the federal government, and the right people should be paying for it, the way the rest of the country does business? We need to spend our time and our energy educating our legislators, our governor, president of our university, Everybody who's going to go up there and supposedly fight the good fight doesn't know what we just saw. They think we're going to come up with $200 million in a, in a little gift bag. And so, I just don't see that happening. So what I'll, I'll, two, two points of clarity. Um, and one, for credit's sake, 
Um, the pie chart was from the AAMC and, and not from Brookings, so I just for, uh, but that's minor. Um, second, uh, your, your point on philanthropy I think is well taken. Uh, the, the one caveat is that for, uh, and, and Deb can speak more clearly to this for sure, um, startup funds for a medical school are going to rely much more heavily on philanthropy, so those philanthropic needs will probably be a bit more upfront. The data that you showed were all medical schools that were in existence over time. Double. Well, yeah. well sure, but That's I just wanted million. to clarify on that. Okay. That is the revenue of existing medical schools. So let me just help you see what's there. If an existing medical school, take Hopkins, has a faculty practice with 2,000 doctors practicing in it, and they bring in $100 million, that's in that pie chart. For a new medical school, I'll take mine, with no faculty practice for the first two or three years, that the piece of that pie was zero. And in the early days of our medical school, there were only two pieces in the pie, state support and philanthropy. And what happens, so the anatomy of a new medical school's revenue, you start off with the state approving it, okay, before philanthropists even get involved. So you start off with 100% state support. Then, once it's been approved, the philanthropists jump on board, and if you're lucky, you might have as much as 50% coming from philanthropy. And once you get that started and you hire the scientists, well, you have to hire them, they have to build their labs, and that's when the research portfolio starts to grow. And then you hire the clinicians and they start practicing, and the practice portfolio. So in the stage of your development, the pie chart, and the reason I show that pie chart is because I want my clinicians to know they're gonna be responsible for expanding their piece if we're gonna grow into a mature medical school. And our scientists, they can't think because the state funded us from the beginning, we can be on state funds for the rest of our lives doing research. I'm expecting them to bring in the NIH R01s and other things. But initially, it's really the state and the philanthropists, and that, that's how it has to be to start. The rest will come if you've got that support at the beginning. And, and I, I want to say one other thing, and it has to do with the osteopathic schools and the private schools. We have all of those in Florida. We have two osteopathic schools, and we have the University of Miami, which is a great, big, and wonderful private school. And the way we work together to keep messy things away from being discussed in the legislature or at the Board of Governors, where maybe the understanding isn't quite as, as detailed about medicine as it is with the medical school deans, we have a Council of Florida Medical School Deans. And we meet monthly by phone. We have a two-hour meeting monthly to discuss the issues that are all of ours. And we try to iron them out and create positions together to bring to the Florida legislature and to the governor and to ACA and to all the organizations that we need to support us. And I think if you do that in this state, you've got osteopathic medical schools, private medical schools, and other public another public medical school, you'll find that you can get a lot done that way. And I just want to go back to the philanthropy issue and tell you that Nevada is what Nevada is. And as I look at the whole thing, it's all a matter of timing. If we wait for the legislature, right now UNLV is funding what we're doing. If we wait till the legislature even comes in and assuming they come in with the $27 million for two years, in um, July, we'll be, we, we will be probably not able to actually get our accreditation documentation done. So here, I agree that they, that to me, actually asking the state of Nevada for the $43 million 10 years from now is not asking for, for much. I will say that in Kansas, we got $100 million of support for our medical school from the state legislature. So I am used to bigger numbers. I would certainly love to work on that as we move across this time frame. But to get started and to get started now, we actually need the philanthropy first. And if we don't get it, it's only going to slow things down. It's not that it's going to make it not happen. Just a note on that. We have six electoral votes. Kansas has six electoral votes. They're the same size state. Did you know that? Except we have more GDP because we're richer. 
We have more base to pull a hundred million out to put into a med school. And here's Kansas putting a hundred million dollars into a med school. Asking for 43 million down the road is letting the state off the hook. Honestly, <laughs> enough. Just Get a one life. quick observation. I love the phrase anatomy of funding. So thank you for that. Um, I'm curious about the federal funding piece, John. <laughs> you had mentioned, you alluded to what so many of us know, <laughs> which like is that, that Nevada, yeah. our performance in terms of receipt of federal funding is pretty abysmal. And it's been that for 35 years, sans 1986, because of a great winter storm from FEMA funding. But as we look at federal funding as it relates to healthcare and specifically a medical school, I'm wondering two things. One, why is this a particularly advantageous space to increase our receipts of federal funding? And two, you mentioned that funds beget funds. Can you elaborate on that? Sure. So this is a particularly uh, good area to capitalize on funds in large part because there are just a lot of funds. There's a lot of money that is spent federally on health care and, and not in the ways that are typically vilified and talked about in Medicare and Medicaid. And, uh, VA and others, but in terms of research dollars, I mean, the, the U.S. government is one of, um, uh, if not the largest supporter of f uh, funded research in the United States, and healthcare is, is um, uh, you know, an area where there are tremendous needs for funded research. I mean, I'm a social scientist, we don't, we get a pittance, but the hard sciences and the, the medical sciences, they, they do quite well. With the expansion of health care coverage under the Affordable Care Act, as well as, well as the increase in um, uh, the federal government mandate in this area, it, within the ACA, there are federal funding opportunities specifically for that. There were initially health care uh, funds available in the stimulus bill, in the stimulus law, that then transitioned, that allowed these agencies to understand what works and what doesn't. It was a goal of the stimulus law. And now, federal agencies are transitioning some of their funding priorities because of what they learned from uh, uh, the American Reinvestment and Recovery Act. And so, there are a lot of ways in which uh, healthcare is expanding in the United States, and it's also expanding in terms of federal government interest. And that will be true no matter who the next president is, no matter who is in control of Congress. It, it's just, it's a reality in American government funding right now. Um, you're, Second part, well, your second part of your question, I'm sorry, I've forgotten it. Funding begets funding. Oh, yeah, so I was referring to faculty members. So, uh, and this is true in social sciences, hard sciences, medical sciences, across the board. If you're getting NIH or NSF or other federal funds, uh, it's telling you a few things about the uh, principal investigator. One, they have research interests that are appealing enough both to the topic and to the peer review process that they're getting funded. They're a quality enough researcher, educator, and academic that their ideas are getting out there. And federal agencies consider the receipt of your, the previous receipt of federal funds in understanding whether or not you're a risk. Most programs are like that. Um, NSF surely is. And so an individual who gets federal funding, a, a researcher at a university, a faculty member at a university or a medical school who gets federal funding is likely to get federal funding again. Let me say this in a, in a more operational way. Let's suppose you have a budget of, I don't know, $40 million for your medical school. And with that budget, you've hired 10 research faculty and 10 clinical faculty. You're paying the salaries of your 10 research faculty. They submit grants to the NIH. They get the grants because they're good. Those grants now fund operations in their lab and a portion of their salary. So if all 10 of your faculty get those grants, the funding that is now paying a portion of each of their salaries will allow you to hire two more faculty. And, those, and will allow you to hire technicians and buy supplies and their research grows. <laughs> and those two new faculty do the same. So the funding that we as a state invest in our medical school and say, okay, this is the little bit you can have, $40 million to run your medical school. And initially you might have you know, a, a, a small number of faculty. If your faculty are good and successful, which is why those success numbers are so important to me, you then have more money, and you have more money, because your faculty know, and that's why the pie chart is important, because that research portfolio grows, it means you're hiring more people. 
And as the clinical portfolio grows, you know, I have, let's say, 20 faculty that are going to be teaching clinical medicine. But they have to practice because otherwise they'll be out of date in no time. So I have Pegasus Health, a little clinic where they practice. They're no threat to the community doctors. They're small. But as they see patients and that brings in additional dollars, we can expand that practice to make it a little bit better and things grow. And so that's what the operational answer to how does money bring in money. I think I'm saying the same thing yeah, you no, are. No, just that's definitely right. last comment. I'm going to make the last comment. And it has nothing to do with size of market. Uh, Pittsburgh, where I'm from, is the same size as Las Vegas. Uh, our medical center is 500 million in research. We have 5,000 faculty. Uh, we have an $11 billion budget in this medical center. We have the same population. So don't let anybody fool you that you're too big or too small. Well, and okay, so that's not the last comment. One more comment. Um, additionally, the other thing is is that a lot of the grants, both at NIH and through the CDC, are two. They have two things. One, they have um, actual mentorship. So you have to. So you bring in additional faculty that have to be mentored. So you bring in junior faculty. So that's another wh area where people get funded. They have postdocs or postdoctoral fellowships as well. So there's a lot of ways that once you get the money, and then there's also private funding that comes along as well. That says, because you have this program, now we want to fund a fellow, or we want to fund an internship. So there's a lot of ways that it's, it's a snowball effect, and it gets bigger, not smaller. And so now, oh. Go ahead, no, finish. No, 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 so I was about to Final word? What, what's Final that? Word. So, Final word. Oh. Question. All right, okay. this is the absolute last question. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I appreciate I, I am one of those legislators who's supposed to be hearing this stuff, and that's why I'm here. And that's why I was here a year ago. Um, I also happen to be a physician, and I've been a medical school faculty member my whole career, uh, including at the University of Nevada School of Medicine. Um, the question I have, really, Mr. Hudak, primarily for you, uh, for Mr. Lang, based on your presentation a year ago, which I know was based on, Mr. Rumbaugh, what, what, your, uh, what mm -hmm. your group did. Uh, both of you have made comments that the University of Nevada, Reno, is not accomplishing what it's supposed to accomplish through its medical school. Um, last year, I believe you said that, that the economic impact Rob, with, for that school should be about 600 million, and it is 282 million. Um, today, we talked about their research funding, that they're getting 12 million. You said they need another 50 million a year. The question I have is this. What's the problem? What is the school doing wrong? And if we, because we don't know what that is, we can't fix it there, and we also run the risk of making the same mistake again, which it's would be tragic. Very, it's a really good question. Thank it you. really has nothing to do with the school. It has everything to do with the scale of the market. That school does about as well in all those measures as the North Dakota school that was started on pretty much the same day. The difference is North Dakota had actually more people than Nevada when that school began. But because Nevada has grown to the south, the market that it serves, the number of patients that it serves, the number of research uh, procedures and Yes. The bulk of the clinical activity for the existing University of Nevada School of Medicine is already here in Southern Nevada. But what's happening there is the didactic training and the amount of subspecialties where most of the money is. When I, when I compare you to the community I'm from, we have all 128 subspecialties in Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh's the same size as Las Vegas. We export zero people, even to Cleveland two hours away, nobody goes to Cleveland. Even Baltimore, four hours away where Hopkins is, nobody goes to Baltimore. We keep all the money in our market. So one of the reasons why the medical enterprise, the academic medical enterprise is so small in Reno and in Nevada is that there's not enough to keep those dollars there. I'm not surprised that the economic impact is uh, 280 million for unsum. Actually, it's not unsum's fault. There isn't a market for academic medicine at the scale it needs to be. A second medical school anchoring Southern Nevada will strengthen that economic base 
add the subspecialties that are needed, and keep UNSUM, in my report, actually get UNSUM up to where it should be in economic impact, and they will grow as well. And if you just look at any of the data from the other states that have added new medical schools, uh, I know Deb's medical school adds about a half a billion dollars to its state's number, and it's actually helped Florida uh, get to the next level. Florida used to export people to Atlanta, to Emory. They'd export people up the East Coast to Philly, to Boston, to, uh, to New York. Florida's doing a really nice job now of not exporting its medical care uh, to the Northeast, but for many, many years, Florida also lost its patients predominantly to Boston and New York where a lot of people had migrated. I'm not in any way saying that the economic impact of UNSUM is anything about what that school has done. It's really the scale of the operation and the need to broaden that scale through a second medical school. So I'll be brief. I, I agree with everything that was just said, but there's an additional um, factor as well in, in terms of federal funding, and that is uh, the university is just not getting a lot of it, and there are some reasons for that in terms of uh, what faculty are, are, are doing. I mean, I haven't gotten into a deep dive, of, nor, nor do I have the medical specialty to, to evaluate what problems are causing lower levels of federal competitive research funding for uh, the Nevada Medical School. But there is a gap there relative to peer institutions, uh, relative to other state flagships uh, with medical schools. So there is a deficit. Earlier when I said uh, they needed $50 million, that was not a, a comment on, uh, in or, uh, on the quality of what they're doing. That was to get them to about the mean. And so now it's not to say that uh, the medical school would have to be at the mean because it is one of the smallest uh, public medical schools in the country. And so the expectation that their research funding would be at the mean, I think, is a little much. But at the same time, $10 million a year in research funding for a medical school is not, not a lot. And um, as Deb said, that creates ripple effects within a medical school in terms of how money can be used and how scarce resources, and every medical school faces scarce resources, even if the president offers you whatever you want, no, the, uh, resources, <laughs> resources are still <laughs> scarce, um, how that money gets moved around. But like Paul said, there's, there are market aspects to this that Reno cannot help. It is a small city with a medical school. Um, that, uh, there are other small cities. Scranton has a medical school now, too. It's not going to do as well as Orlando, although it's a private one. Um, it's not going to do as well as Orlando or New York or, or uh, even New Haven, for that matter. Um, it's just a, a, an aspect of market, population, location, and, and those are all challenges facing, uh, uh, facing Reno that there might be ways to address it, but, I mean, you can't address where it is geographically. And so there are challenges that surely can be overcome, and then there are challenges that are more structural. <coughs> All right? What? Oh, so, sorry. Well, I think we're, that's it. We're over our limit. Now, <laughs> it's good to be able to limit. It means people are energetic. I'll leave you on this thought. The Virgin Islands is getting a medical school. That's what I took out of this. <laughs> I want to go to that medical school. How do I, I'm not even a doctor, and I want to go there. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. <laughs>